Yes, welcome in, friends. How we doing? How you doing? Tone, hi. Chat, How you hi. Doing, my friend? Everybody streaming, everybody listening. Hi. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Uh, it's, uh, I'll tell you, I've had an interesting day today, Tone. Um, first of all, in the Philadelphia area, it's freezing today. Okay. It, it well, it's is, pretty, it's it pretty is, cold down here too, man. It's pretty cold down here too. Yeah, I think the, I think right now it is uh, eighteen degrees, eighteen right now. Ooh. So I'm, um, yeah, that's cold. That's cold, and it's very, 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 very icy outside. So if anybody uh, again is in the in the greater Philadelphia area, the Delaware Valley, if you haven't gone out yet today, and if you don't have to, don't just hang with us. Um, but if you are heading out. Be careful because it's bad. The roads are bad. I saw several accidents in my travels today. Um, I was sitting in a lot of traffic due to it and hope everybody's okay, first of all. Um, but yeah, it's bad. I, in fact, I'm driving, I was driving up my street probably about approximately an hour ago. And I'm coming up my street and I see this older man taking out his recycling trash, right? And mm -hmm. he's coming down his driveway. And I see him start to lose his balance and slip, man. And the guy went down. So I, I pull over. I got out. I helped him get up. I helped him put his recycling back in the, you know, the trash can. And he was all right, thankfully. It wasn't anything really major. But like, how old do you think he was? He was definitely like late sixties, maybe early seventies. Okay. Somewhere around right. there. But anyway, he's all right. He, he's okay. Thank God. So, but it's he I'm like. So when I, he fell, what, did he fall flat on his back? Was it more so coming like, down? And I could see, like, as forward? I'm, I, I knew he was starting to lose balance. That's like right when I passed him, and then I kept my eye on him, and he went down. Thankfully, like, like face, not face first, like upper body first. But he braced himself with his arms, so he right. landed on his arms, uh, and he was okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, be, just be careful out there. And, and I know your area, you guys, it's, it's way colder than they're usually accustomed to there. Yeah. And all that yeah. stuff. So it, hopefully, they're, um, like it's funny down here. <clears throat> they can't. They don't know what to do when it gets cold, right? If it gets <laughs> if it if it gets below twenty degrees, they they lose their minds down here. All right. So um, they start sending out all these emails. You know, like they're like yo, know, the property management companies and the landlords, and they send out emails saying, "Hey." Make sure you do this so your pipes don't freeze. Do this, do that. Mm. And I'm like, wow, I'm really not used to these. I'm not <laughs> used to this level of care, you know, from any kind of, you know, property manager and landlord, you know, because I'm from Philly. And, you know, when we everything is reinforced to deal with that level of cold. Right. And every yeah. now and again, you have moments where things do freeze. It happens. But for the most part, Philly is pretty well prepared for most of the elements. Right. Down here, man, 20 degrees or lower. Make sure you run your water just a little bit so it doesn't freeze in the pipes. Good make point. Sure, make sure make sure you keep the cabinets open so the heat uh, so the heat can get down there. I'm like, okay, all right, no no worries. So so for the past couple of days, me and the wife have been you know making sure yeah you know major sinks in the house and you know. But there's got to be a part of you that's like, dude, do you know where I'm from? Like, really? I I'll yo, be all right, <laughs> bro. It's 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 so often I say to myself. I'm from Philly. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> but me being from Philly doesn't change the fact that my pipes can freeze. No, I get that, man. <laughs> Listen, you, and, and trust me, you right. do not play around with, with any kind of water or pipes. Mm -mm. Trust pipes. me. You don't want that problem. You don't. Mm -mm. I've lived it. You don't want the problem. Okay. I'd much rather have electrical issues than water issues. You are correct, sir. The last thing you want is water issues. All right. Anyway, uh, so hope everybody's doing well. Uh, let me start with this. So the Eagles will be uh, clearing out their lockers today, having their exit interviews today. We may get something today. I don't know. We're going to have at 1130 Mike Sealski from the Inquirer. He's going to join us. Uh, he wrote some pretty, pretty heavy stuff about the Eagles defense. In fact, the gist of the story was the only person who can really contain Hassan Reddick is Matt Patricia. So you get, <laughs> you get the gist of what he, he wrote about yesterday. All right. So anyway. Um, we'll talk to him at 1130, 1230, Jeff Kerr is down at the Novacare complex tone. So we will, we will check in with our guy, Jeff Kerr from CBS sports. And just, I, I want to do a lot of things with Jeff because he has some great numbers on the Eagles offense and, and some of the issues that they've had. But I, I also want just a vibe. I, I want a pulse of what's happening down there, what the thoughts are down there. So we're going to go right to the scene, uh, at 1230, but that's kind of where I want to start with you and everybody today. 
Um, you know, we know how raw it is the next day. You know, especially when you're coming off a Monday night game. We were on, you know, so bad. Here's the question I have for you, Tony. Do you feel any differently? Has your perspective changed? Could be good, could be bad, could be you know, whatever. Has your perspective changed at all on the Eagles season and that loss at all with 24 hours of perspective? Uh, no, not really. Because we came into the season with pretty high expectations. This team's coming off of a Super Bowl loss, and it wasn't like the Super Bowl loss proved that they didn't belong there. The Super Bowl loss was damning. It was a three-point loss. The quarterback fumbled. The head coach made some questionable decisions in key moments. Um, the defense couldn't get a stop at all in the second half. There were just so many things that went into that loss that we said to ourselves, man, we were so close. It, it, it was just so many intricate um, parts of that loss that stuck with us. So we saw we saw this team as a team that can definitely get back, a team that's going to compete, um, is going to be in the mix, right? And, of course, rosters change. Um, getting back to a Super Bowl, especially after you lose, is extremely difficult. Um, doesn't really happen that often. So there were a lot of things working against the Philadelphia Eagles at the time, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think we all knew that, but I think because of our fandom, we ignored the trends. We ignored history and felt like the Philadelphia Eagles can buck history and buck the trend. And, um, you know, our, our fearless leader at the quarterback position, I would be able to see us through any obstacle, through any uh, hailstorm. Yeah. But lo and behold, we realized that Jalen Hurts is human this season. And we realized that Jalen Hurts can't be the only one to lift you over the top, right? It takes everybody, but you're definitely not going to get where you got to go where your quarterback is turning the ball over tw um, 20 times in the season or 19, yep. however you want to however you want to split hairs, whatever, 20 turnovers. Um, you can't get anywhere when you're when your head coach um has his own limitations when it comes to game planning, uh, when it comes to um getting guys prepared every day, when the message is is, is going dry. You can't get to where you got to get to when you have no effort from your star players. You have no effort from your role players. You have no effort from your bench guys. Um, the second half of the season was a – the entire thing was a tale of two seasons, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you really pay attention, if we're honest with ourselves, it seemed like the writing was on the wall for something for something to kind of you know break the levy. But we ignored it because we were excited. They came off that Buffalo win, which was, you know, storybook. We just felt like this team was, you know – going against every single obstacle and still coming up um, on top. And then playoffs and, you know, those last several games, you know, Niners, Cowboys, Giants, Cardinals, Giants, it it just showed you how bad this team really was internally and how they weren't, from a foundational standpoint, they weren't really as solid as we thought they were. Um, the first sign of trouble, this team kind of fell off a cliff. And we realized, or at least me, in my humble opinion, and I may, I may be on the island in this, this team was front runners. Yeah, they were front runners from you know from top to bottom. And the moment they came across any real obstacle, any real challenge, yeah, um, they couldn't get the job done. And it exposed the deficiencies on the defensive side even more. It exposed the limitations of Nick Sirianni and uh, Jalen Hurts even more. Uh, you know, the offensive line they didn't have their greatest season. Um, still a good season because you got all pros and Pro Bowls across it. Didn't, but still, um, there were just so many things working against the Philadelphia Eagles this year. And I feel like most of all, they were working against themselves. Um, I feel like they beat themselves more than anything this year. And uh, my opinion, my feelings have not changed. I'm going to continue to hold the team accountable. And they're still in, in, and they're still in the boiling pot for me. Um, I'm, I'm very disappointed with how the way the season ended. I'm very disappointed. With um, you know, with the ride we've been on the past several weeks, um, I expected more from this coaching staff. I expected way more from these players, and um, it's going to be a very long off season, people. But I do believe there's a lot of work to be done, and today and the next few days are going to tell us a lot about where this team is going from a directional standpoint, from a leadership standpoint. Uh, first of all, very well said. Um, secondly, uh, I have, I'm like you. I don't feel any better. Uh, I don't feel like I've changed. I, I feel as raw mm -hmm. and pissed off as I did yesterday. Um, just because this slowly unfolded in front of our eyes doesn't make it any easier. 
Um, I'm angry because I my expectation was this team gets back to and wins a Super Bowl because you came short of winning a Super Bowl last year, and the only thing acceptable this year was winning a Super Bowl. I'm 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 ticked off that I watched, and I'll start with the offense. I watched an offense continually look predictable, look unprepared, uh, look like they've never seen a blitz, and this is the goddamn NFL, and you've never seen a blitz before. Um, I watched a quarterback revert and regress um, under this coaching staff. I watched uh, on the other side of the ball, I watched them bring in a defensive coordinator that they clearly didn't believe in and then pull the rug out from under him after 14 games and go to a guy who made it worse. Uh, I saw a defensive line that underachieved in a massive way. I saw guys running into one another. I saw guys making business decisions. Um, I saw a defense that didn't have enough talent because they didn't properly allot enough money to the linebacker position or the safety position. I saw guys that they let walk play well elsewhere, uh, namely uh, TJ Edwards. And let's also throw Derek Barnett in there just for fun, even though he wasn't doing anything here. Why wasn't he doing anything here? Why couldn't you get more out of him? Why is Houston able to get something out of him? Yes, maybe he needed to change the scenery and it was a wake-up call. I don't know, but I know he played well for them and he didn't play well here for the Eagles. Mm -hmm. So I saw a lot of things that I don't like. And now I look at a team where I totally question everything about the coaching. I question if the quarterback can get back to where he was. I question a defense that needs two linebackers, two safeties, two or three corners. Uh, You better hope Nolan Smith can play, or you need at least two edge rushers. You might lose Fletcher Cox. You're likely to lose Jason Kelsey, who was a first-team All-Pro. So you're going to take a hit there. I don't care who steps in. And I, and I, Jurgens, I'm sure will be fine, but he's not going to be Jason Kelsey. So I see a lot of things that I don't like, and I'm just as angry now. And I'm not, I'm not losing that, that same energy that I had yesterday. It's not going anywhere. Uh, and I, I will be on them period. I'm not, I'm not letting up. Sorry. Not happy. We're here. Well, here's the thing, Rob. I think it hurts even more because of everything you laid out, you have so many unknowns heading into the off season. Um, these past two years, you've been on borrowed time, right? Your superstar center has been teetering between retirement and playing still. Um, your superstar D tackle on Fletcher Cox, you guys have been going back and forth about whether or not he's going to be back. And there were moments where we thought we lost him. You know, it's just that um, you this team, let's just call it what it is, right? They fooled us, Rob. Yeah, they fooled us. And I think that's the part that kills us the most as um, spectators of this team. They, they 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 fooled us. And, you know, I say to myself sometimes, there's so many talented people with pedigree and experience on this team. And yet the effort, the will, the desire, the fire was where it was when we watched them in that Buccaneers game those Giants games, those Cardinals games, those Seahawks games, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to understand how a group that has Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox, Darius Slay, Lane Johnson, Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, um, Landon Dickerson, Jordan Maylotta. Um, I'm trying to figure out. Kevin Byer, I'm trying to figure out how a group that has that many vested veterans, guys that have been around the block, guys that understand the game, guys that know guys that know what it takes to prepare and to lock in for a matchup. I'm trying to understand how a group with this level of experience and pedigree can fall so far from an effort standpoint, from a production standpoint, just from a reliability or a stable standpoint. And Ray Lewis says something on the broadcast when he was with Peyton and Eli. Mm -hmm. And it was on the touchdown, I believe, that went to um, – I believe it was the touchdown yeah, that went to Trey Palmer, the 56-yard touchdown. I believe it was that one. Or maybe the David Moore. I don't know. <clears throat> Nonetheless. Yeah. Yep. He said, to me, that looks like a team that's playing for self. Yeah, individuals. He said they look like a bunch he of said individuals. They look like a there. bunch of individuals out there. Yeah. Right? You guys are supposed to contain him, put him in a cup, you know, 
Yep. The angle. He said tackling is all about angles. I'm seeing guys that are not working together to achieve the goal. And I'm trying to figure out, once again, a team that's been through the ringer like this, that has the level of experience and pedigree, how do you guys get to a point when you're playing for self? And then I have to ask, what's the culture in the building? How are you guys being communicated to from the coaches, right? You know, you know, some people say, and, I, and, I, and I've talked to Sills about this a couple of times, you know, his mindset is, look, you guys get paid. I don't need motivation from you. I don't need motivation from my coach. You pay me, you play me, I'm out there to deliver. I don't care what's going on. My I job agree. is to deliver. I agree and I completely that. agree with that sentiment. Yep. You guys get paid multi-millions of dollars. Some of you guys are six-figure guys, seven-figure guys. Some of you guys are eight-figure guys. Some of y'all are nine-figure guys, Jalen Hurts. So why does it – what does it take for a coach to get you motivated? Well, <laughs> the direct deposit should motivate you enough. Mm -hmm. But clearly people and humans are not that simple, right? People in their everyday jobs, I'm pretty sure they get paid whatever they get paid. And maybe they make good money. But does that fully motivate them, right? Sometimes you need proper leadership to motivate you. The money is maybe just a byproduct of the role. But, you know, part of me says, yeah, you guys get paid millions of dollars. Why the hell should we have to motivate you? Another part of me says, you have a coach for a reason. So I, 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 I'm, I'm teetering between those two competing thoughts. I'm curious to know what you think. Okay, here's what I can't get away from, Tone. and I, I love the way you just laid everything out, by the way. But here's what I can't get away from. Any way I slice this on either side of the ball, and I again, I'll take special teams out of this because Michael Clay did a great job. They're horrifically coached. They're horrifically coached team on both sides of the ball. I don't think they're prepared well during the week. I don't think they have answers when a team does something that that maybe they didn't. First of all, even when they did expect, like, like Tampa Bay wasn't trying to fool you. They did exactly what you thought, and you still weren't ready for it. I can't imagine what goes on in the meetings. I can't imagine what's schemed up. I can't imagine any of this stuff. Like it, it, it's, it's beyond comprehension to me how poorly coached they are in both sides of the ball. It really is. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable. You know, later on, I, I came up with this game for us later on um, that we're going to play. It's called a uh, comeback or go home. It's a little experiment. All right. And I'm pretty sure you can kind of get the gist of, you know, where I'm going with it. Um, I'll explain it more later on. We could probably get we could probably knock it out after our interviews with Sealski and Kerr. But uh, just think about it. Right. Come back or go home. Who do you want to come back? Who do you want to just okay. skedaddle? All right. You know right what I'm mean? looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't come up with a list of players, but we're going to go. We're going to go position by position. Yeah. Because I, th because I think it's worth the conversation. Right. Where did we go wrong from a culture standpoint? Where yeah. did we go wrong from a production standpoint? Who did we overvalue? Who did we undervalue? I love that. Um, Let's do that at so twelve. We have to. We have to really get into this because I don't think I've ever seen a Philadelphia Eagles team this listless, that like this level of passion before. I've never seen it before. I've been watching the Philadelphia Eagles for a long time. I can't remember a moment where I've seen a team like this effort. I've seen lesser talented Eagles teams. I've seen Eagles teams, um, you know, with limitations. I've seen Eagles teams that have had the injury bug. I've seen all that. I haven't, I can't remember a Philadelphia Eagles team that completely checked out the way they did. I'm sure that, like, that's the shocking part to me. And I, and, and I will tell you, okay. So, um, Th this leads into something else uh, I mm, wanted to discuss. Interesting. That's an interesting point by clothes. Yeah, basically some some dudes became fat cats, got paid, and their their work ethic isn't there. Which which leads me to this. Hmm. So Jason Kelsey on the New Heights podcast with his brother Travis said basically, "Hey, look, despite what's being reported, I still haven't made up my mind. What what I didn't want to do was make an emotional decision as soon as the game ends, and it, and it'd be something I regret. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but but he said I want to take some time." And figure it out, right? Okay. He he got he got to sit with himself, sit with the wife, sit with the kids, right? You know his parents probably. He he's probably going to talk to Travis a bunch of times, like 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 they're doing a podcast, obviously. But you know, it's it's a big decision he's making. It, it is, and and I think the and I think that's first of all that's smart in anything you do in life. Don't try not to make emotional decisions, not rash decisions at the time. It's it's easier said than done, but sometimes just take a a pause, take a beat, and just calm down. But Rob, so I think that's smart. It's easier to it's, it's even harder to make that decision when you're 
still at the top of your You're craft. You're still a beast. Yeah. So, You're but, but still at the top of your craft. How can it's so hard? I, I, I can only imagine. It's easier to make the decision when you clearly have lost a step. That man's clearly just based off everyone else, Pro Bowl, All Pro. He's still at the top of his craft. How can, yeah. How can well, we deny it? What really got me though, watching it, Tone, watching the clip. So at the end, he was discussing, you know, uh, some of the players said to him, hey, dude, uh, you know, I feel bad for you. You had to go out like this or whatever. And he was like, man, don't feel bad for me. Uh, like, I, I gave it everything I had every minute I played the game. And then he started to get emotional at the end, you know, and, and he was he was tearing up and you could see it even it got Travis for a minute, whatever. But wh why I bring that up? A, it just shows you how much the guy cares. But I'm thinking to myself. How hard it must be for a guy like Kelsey to be giving everything he has at his age. And there are clearly younger cats on that team that aren't trying their hardest. Like that has got to piss him off beyond belief. And he Honestly. has to ask himself, do I want to come back to this yeah. environment? Yeah. Do I want to put my, my body on the line again with some of these dudes? And, and my answer would be, Honestly, if I'm Jason Kelsey and I've accomplished what he's accomplished, look, if you still have it in your heart, by all means, you can still do it physically. Nobody denies that. But I'm I'm probably thinking like, you know what, man, I'm good. Let me go. Let me go chill. Let me be able to lift my daughters up, you know, <laughs> where I or where I'm not dragging my my ankle around in the, uh, you know, the living room or whatever. Like, I, I, I just it, it would piss me off, man, if I'm him like big time. Yeah. And he has he has a lot of reasons to not come back to the game. He has a lot of extracurriculars that are going well for him. Yep. Um, arguably the biggest sports podcast um, in the game. You know, ar arguably the biggest sports, arguably the biggest player centric sports podcast. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, you know, you know, that's player led. Uh, this team, this Howie Roseman and, and Jeffrey Lurie, they're going to have a tough sell because they know damn well they can't afford to lose him just yet. Yeah. They just can't. Yeah. Based off what we've seen this year, they can't mm -hmm. afford to lose that man yet. They're not ready to make that transition. As much as they think Cam Jurgens is ready, they're not ready to make that transition. And um, I'm not sure if Cam Jurgens is fully ready to make that transition, if I'm being honest. No, I, I – so, Listen, we, it's, a, it's an unknown. You, you're going to go from the creme de la creme – so we, so you just don't know, and that's a hard spot for anybody. Like I, feel and we already have too many unknowns at this point, right? And I feel for anybody who has to take over for a legend, it's hard. It really is. It's hard to follow a future Hall of Famer. You know that is what it is. Like if the guy's retiring, it is what it is. There's nothing you can do. You have the succession plan in place. Kelsey was the one who scouted this guy and liked him. So I'm going to believe what he thinks and what the organization thinks, and that's fine. But the other thing you're losing tone, in addition to just a great football player, is you're losing an emotional leader, you know, on this team. So it's a, it's a big deal, man. It's a big deal. And again, he said he hasn't made up his mind yet. So you, you take Jason Kelsey at, at his word. I have no reason to, to doubt him. The guy's always been a straight shooter. So, uh, all right, let's get a timeout. And I, I'm, I, I'm really excited to talk to Mike Sealski and ask you his take on everything that's gone down with this team. Again, Jeff Kerr uh, a little bit later in the show as well, because it is a day where something could happen here, Tone. Mm-hmm. Something could happen today. So if we get any word of anything that's coming down, we'll pass that along also. That's Tone DeShields. I'm Rob Ellis. We're Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. Let's talk about Bravo Pizza of Havertown. Been going there since I was a kid. Family owned since 1985. They have just the best variety and food that you could possibly get. 20 different styles of pizza. Slices to go. Specialized pizza, however you want it, they will make it. But you know, for pizza, I get it. Fresh pasta, sandwiches, wraps, wings, salads. Bravo Pizza is also committed to the community. They have fundraisers for schools, for charities, for little leagues, where the proceeds go to those organizations. You can follow them at the Bravo Pizza of on Instagram and Facebook for daily specials and promotions. They're located at 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center in Havertown, Pennsylvania, 1305 Westchester Pike Manoa Shopping Center, Havertown, PA, 610-446-3810. That's how you reach them, 610 610- 4463810 Bravo Pizza of Havertown. I remember getting my heart broken when they lost the Super Bowl in 2004. We were big Eagles fans. 
We moved to South Philly because of the Eagles. When they won, we went straight to Broad Street and uh, everybody was going nuts over there. And it was just a, a memory that you'll never forget.